Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I bring greetings to you from the saints at Zion Lutheran Church in Bethalto, Illinois, where I have the pleasure of serving as pastor. But it's good to be here. It's good to be back at Webster Gardens. Uh, specifically good to be back uh, with the people that helped shape and form me. But it's also just to be good in this space. I mean, I was baptized in the old sanctuary, but it was one of the first classes to be confirmed here in the new sanctuary. And so I may be a little bit biased, but I've always really liked this house of worship. So much so that when I was serving as a DCE in Lake of the Ozarks, uh, we were in the process of preparing to build a new sanctuary. And so I sent him a picture of Webster Gardens Sanctuary and said, hey, here's, here's something maybe that we could we'd talk about. Because there's a couple features of this sanctuary that I really liked. I kind of like that, that uh, the floor kind of slopes down a little bit so everyone can see well. And so I threw that idea out there. And I was met with objections. They said, well, downstairs from this sanctuary, we will have school classrooms, so we can't do that. And I said, no, we can. We'll just have the kindergarten on the bottom, and we'll have the fifth grade on the top, and the classroom will grow as the kids do. Uh, apparently, architecturally, that's a problem. So we didn't do that. I said, all right, well, how about this? What about a balcony? I mean, I, I really like that, that way you've, you've got more space for, for people uh, to see, more space for people to sit and worship. And they go, no, because of the, the downstairs section, it would be too much weight to add a balcony. All right. What if we just have a little balcony off to the side, like for the two old guys from the Muppets <laughs> to kind of heckle? The, what about that? No dice. And for some weird reason, after that, I don't think I was invited back to the building committee <laughs> meetings. But there, there was one feature of this sanctuary and of Christ the King at the lake that ended up making it in. And, and that's the anchor, the focal point of the sanctuary, the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that's not just meant to be the anchor for a sanctuary, a house of worship, no, the cross is meant to be the foundation, the anchor of the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, that, it's the cross, the word of God, that is what we've been talking about in this series, Life on the Rock. That when our, when our life is rooted, is built, is established on the word of God, the promises in Jesus Christ, that is a foundation that is firm. And the reason we need to think about this is because it's so easy for us to begin building our life on something else, a foundation that we find out is sand. Today, we're going to think about the foundation of what other people say about us, the foundation of arrogance. See, when my life is built on what other people say about me, that's where I find my meaning, my identity. I go searching after their acceptance. What happens in our lives is we then find ways to puff ourselves up. We become our own best cheerleader, our own hype man. We end up sounding a lot like this. Skeeters, you can be on their team, aside from the Patriots and the Ducks, with double-digit wins on the young season, 1-1. One, one. Cordula swings and fouls it off towards the broadcast booth, and I make the catch on the foul ball. I am very proud of myself. I hope somebody got video of that as I caught it on the fly. And it's a one-two count. Boy, am I impressive. What a play by me. Boy, am I impressive. What a play by me. Now, ever since I saw that video a while ago, that's a phrase you'll hear tossed out in the Metcalf a household. But the more I, I get to thinking about it, it, doesn't that become the refrain 
for our lives. If my life is built on this foundation of what other people say about me matters, this becomes the way that I live my life. I mean, think about for a second how we use social media. Do we really use it to to connect with other people, to get to know uh, what's going on with our our friends that we don't see as often? No, more often we use it because I I did something great with my family and I want to see what other people think about it. And so we put it up on social media and then we wait to see if the likes, and not, not just the likes, if those are coming in. No, I don't want people to like what I did. I want them to love it. I want to see that heart pop up. Boy, am I impressive. What a play by me. And so when I put something out there and I don't receive the feedback, the comments that, that I want, or I look at the lives of the people around me and what they're putting up on their statuses, and I, man, I don't really have the life that they do. See, when our life is built on what other people say about us, it is a foundation that is frail at best. Think about whenever you've received criticism or a bad review, how often that sticks with you for a long, long time. What we could hear 10 good compliments, but it's the one negative comment, that's what's gonna stick with us. Because they're not just talking about what we did, No, they're talking about who we are. Because our identity, our worth, is attached to what other people say about us. That's why when we we serve, when we do something good, and no one notices, oh, that that is one of the worst things in the world. I cleaned the kitchen and no one came and sang my praises. Look at all the stuff that I did with my kids and they don't seem to remember it. It's like they were two when it happened. Right? Why can't someone just say that I'm impressive? What a play by me. This is how we build our life. And it's a foundation that, that is, is going to crumble. To be needed to hear that from the people around us. And yet, this is how our world is set up. The world is set up so that we feel the most valuable and we find our identity in what other people say about us. Now, you may be thinking, I don't have this problem, right? I don't have this arrogant boasting. No, in fact, I'm my most harshest critic. I can't do anything right. Don't pat yourself on the back for that yet. Because the reality is that may be be a different symptom. Being your harshest critic may be a different symptom than boastful arrogance. But at their core, they have the same problem. Is you're building your foundation on what someone else has said about you. See, we we don't start off by by constantly degrading ourselves or, or putting ourselves down, criticizing everything that we do. No, that is a learned skill. And it is learned because at some point along the line, we failed. We fell short of someone else's standards, and we internalize that. See, whether you're criticizing yourself all the time or you're praising yourself all the time, both of those, the root behind it is my identity is found in what other people say about me. And that is the foundation that is built on sand, and it will crumble. Sometimes when you least least expect it. Sometimes when you're celebrating a milestone in your life. Think about graduation. How great is graduation? You're celebrating your accomplishments. You've got your scholarships, your awards, all that stuff is all listed. It's all on display. And then you move to whatever's next. You move to the workforce. You move uh, to college. And the people around you, they don't know all those things that you did. And what's worse, they don't seem to care. They don't seem to care that I was the president of this club, that I was voted most likely to succeed. They don't seem to care about all this stuff that I had spent my entire time trying to build. And so then you have to start over. 
but this time you're just a little more desperate to make sure that people like you, make sure that you feel worthy and accepted because you don't want to lose what you used to have. Think about when, when the kids leave the nest and you're in that empty nest phase, how difficult that can be. Because so often our lives are wrapped around what the kids are doing. We find our meaning, our identity, our value in that role. And all of a sudden when we don't have it anymore, we're wondering, did I do good enough? Uh, There's all these things that I should have done differently. And because we can't go back and fix it, because we don't have the same influence that we used to, we begin wondering, was it all a waste? Did I do enough? Did I do good enough? Am I good enough? Think about retirement. Right? Retirement, we, we celebrate someone's accomplishments, their achievements. You're the person that everyone looks up to. Everyone asks for advice. And after the celebration is over, you move into retirement, and all of a sudden the phone stops ringing. There's less people that are asking for advice, less people that are praising your accomplishments. You're not producing nearly what you used to. And because our world is built on a foundation of you are what other people say about you, we begin to wonder, does anyone really care about me at all? Am I really valuable anymore? See, a foundation that is built on what other people say about us is a foundation that is on sand, and it will crumble. This is why Jesus has this in view in the Sermon on the Mount. He he takes three different ways of serving as God's people, and he actually uses them to address this issue of arrogance, this foundation that we find. So I encourage you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Because through practices like giving, like praying, like fasting, Jesus brings to mind how a life that is spent focusing on what other people say is a life that is a foundation that's going to crumble. He starts off by talking about giving. This is verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Then he talks about prayer. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Then he talks about fasting. And when you fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. See, what Jesus is targeting here is is our tendency to do good things for the sake of hearing good things from others. Look at me and my giving, my generosity. Look at my praying. Look at my fasting. Boy, am I impressive. What a play by me. See, Jesus is inviting us to realize that the way of the kingdom is not about serving, about doing what God has called us to do for the sake of what we're going to receive in this life. Jesus isn't opposing the practices of giving or prayer or fasting. In fact, with each of these, he says to his disciples, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, he assumes it's happening. The problem isn't with the practice or with the method. It's with the motive. says, don't give, don't pray, don't fast in order to become someone. No, do those things because you already are someone. These practices are meant to flow from who we are, 
Not for us to earn who we are. See, Jesus has this in view because it is so easy in our world to buy into the lie that if if I'm just accepted, if I'm acknowledged, if I'm praised, if other people are talking about me, then I'll be someone. Then I'll be valuable. Then I'll belong. See, the problem with thinking, then I'll be someone, then I'll belong, then I'll be valuable. What does that say about me in the meantime? I'm not worth it. I'm not valuable. I don't belong. Let me tell you, in this kind of a world, in this kind of a system, we spend almost all of our time hoping eventually we'll get there. And then when we get there, what happens? We retire, we graduate, something changes, something happens, and we find ourselves starting all over, wondering, am I worthwhile? Do I matter? God has never wanted you to doubt any of that. So the world has so many ideas about who you are, about what you're worth, about where that all comes from. And we're bombarded with it at all times, from all angles. There's so much noise that is out there. How many of you have tried to to study or focus in a super noisy environment? Right, in about 10 seconds, you end up with a headache. (laughs) Because there's so much else that's going on, I can't focus on what I'm trying to do. Until you pull out some noise-canceling headphones And all of a sudden, the noise is still out there, but it doesn't affect me nearly as much. And I can focus, I can listen to what I've chosen to hear. Wouldn't it be great if we had that in all of life? That is what the word of God is meant to be for you And for me, as disciples of Jesus Christ, the word of God is the voice that we listen to amongst all others. This is how Jesus puts it in John chapter 10. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. What Jesus is teaching here to us as those who have been ushered into the kingdom of God, who are the sheep and the flock of the good shepherd, said there will be these outside voices. There'll be this noise coming from the world, but all you need to listen to is the one voice that matters to listen to the voice of your good shepherd, to cancel out all the others, and to hear and to follow and to obey the one voice that matters. See, there's so much noise that that is out there in the world. We can't cancel it all, but what we can do is to hear that voice and to recognize that's not the voice of my shepherd, and to instead focus not on what the world says, what the word of God says about you. See, the world says you are unlovable. The word of God says God loves you so much he sent his son to this earth for you. The world says you don't belong. The word says that you are a citizen of heaven. The world says, why are you here? 
The Word says you are Christ's ambassador. The world says you're nothing special. The Word says you are made in the image of God. The world says you don't fit in. The Word says you belong to God. The world says you are your worst failure. The word of God says as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. The world says you have to earn God's love. The word says you are saved by grace. The world says you are alone. The word says never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The world says God wouldn't want a person like you. The word says says that you were chosen by God. The world says your mistake. The word says you are made in the image of God. You're chosen by him. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. The world says you don't matter. You're not valuable. The word of God says you are worth dying for. You have infinite value in Christ. You matter. Not because of what your kids have done. And not because of all that you've accomplished. Not because you're going to do great things someday. No, you matter because of what God has done for you. That's who you are. See, I wish that I could make all, the, all that noise, all those voices out there that are trying to cause you to doubt your worth, I wish I could make those all disappear. In fact, I was speaking at a Lutheran high school here recently, and I was talking on, on identity and value in Christ, and I found out afterwards that one of the students, after the talk, stayed in the bathroom and was crying. And so naturally, my first concern was, what did I say? And it turns out it was because of something I said. See, she shared with the teacher later, she said, he's wrong. I'm not valuable. I'm worthless. He doesn't know who I am. I wish I could make those voices, those strongholds disappear from those who are struggling under the weight of those lies. But my response to that that teacher as she was trying to figure out how to minister to that young person, I said, you know what? She's right about one thing. I don't know who she is. I don't know her story. But I know her God. I don't know all the voices that she's listening to, I don't know how loud they are, I don't know how frequently she hears that she's not valuable, but I know the one voice that matters. And unlike those voices, that voice, her good shepherd, said in the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. That voice said, Lazarus, come out, and the dead was raised. That voice on the cross said it is finished and forgiveness was won fully, freely, forever for her. That voice in her baptism reached down and said, I have called you by name, you are mine. I don't have to know who she is, I don't have to know her story because I know her God and his word never fails, amen? That's who you are. You are valuable. You belong because of what God has said about you. And let me tell you, it changes everything. We'll talk more this afternoon about how it it changes our our relationships, our our marriage. It'll change your life when you know your identity and your value is secure in Christ Jesus. But for now, what I want us to think about is out of all those things, that, that whole list of who you are, that you're chosen, you're loved, you're valuable. Ask yourself this question. What of that did I build? What of that did I do? Nothing. (laughs) None of it. 
God did it all for you. Through water and the word, there's true presence in his sacrament through his people. Boy, is he impressive. What a play by God. See, when I know who I am, when when my foundation of my life is centered in him, it changes everything. No longer do I have to live seeking, desiring, needing the approval, the acknowledgement, the acceptance of those around me. I want us to to read, uh, read this statement together. Let's read this together. Instead of worrying about being successful or being noticed, we are set free to be faithful. You no longer have to worry about, well, I have to be noticed when I, when I do something. You are set free to be faithful, to serve even if no one recognizes it, to, to faithfully love your family, even if it's not greatness in the eyes of the world. And we are set free to be faithful. That's why our practice this week that we'll be walking through is to find five different ways that you can serve those around you. But the catch is to do it in secret. So they don't know it was you. They can't pat you on the back. They can't give you a thank you card. They they can't build you up for for what you've done. Because as disciples of Jesus Christ, that is not our motivating idea. No, I serve because God has served me in Jesus Christ. And the one voice that matters is the voice of God telling me to be faithful. When the people that we're serving, when they can't come and thank us, you know what they end up doing? They end up doing exactly what Jesus says at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Boy, is he impressive. What a play by God. May that be the cry of our hearts. What a great God we have in Jesus Christ. And may we root our lives on what he says about us. For in that foundation, when we anchor our lives on the cross, we find our meaning, our identity, our value, everything that we need in listening to the one voice that matters. Boy, is God impressive. What a play by God. Amen.